Hey family, we are so glad that you are joining us for our live stream here at Petra International Ministries. You know, it is such a joy and an honor for us to be able to come to where you are. And so as you're watching, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to just tell us where you're watching from because we know we have family, not only here in the Pittsburgh area, also around the nation and around the world. So we want to know where you're watching from. And so we're really excited because Pastor Cameron Clay is going to give part two of his message. And so we are just ready to receive all that God is going to impart into us today. But now we're going to head into the sanctuary and see what's going on there for a time of worship. Trying to be this great burden that we carry around, but there ought to be a lightness and a liberty in every believer. There ought to be a smile that emanates from deep inside that has nothing to do with what's happening externally. For some people in life, the external determines their internal state but we're the direct opposite what's inside of us determines everything <laughs> that happens around us come on just thank God for freedom in that area thank God for breakthrough in that area hallelujah glory hallelujah thank you Lord thank you Father glory you can be seated in the presence of the Lord it's my armor bearer. All right. he, he heard there was somebody looking for me, so he's like, he's staying real close today. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> oh, he said, you come here. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Boy, I tell you, God is so good. He's doing so many profound, wonderful things, and I'm so excited. I was talking with um, Denise this week, and Shannon's dad had been in a cancer battle, and he was uh, diagnosed as being cancer-free this week. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. I'm telling you, we, we, see, we see all kinds of miracles. I, I told you before, but the one that really got me was the, the woman that was going to have to have her foot amputated. Man, that, that story, I can just think about that, and I get excited in my spirit. She was, she's a part of our family, and they were going to have to cut off her foot, and it was very infected, and so her foot was actually bandaged up, you know, during the period that she was waiting for this surgery to occur. And literally just about all of her heel, all of that was just dead. It was just black. It was literally black and dead. And when they, when they went to go do the surgery, they pulled that bandage off and all that black was in the bandage and she had, and her foot was healed. <laughs> God is God is awesome. Only God could do stuff like that. And you know, I'm it's when God does stuff like that, it's not just for the person. It's it's for that that nurse that was wrapping unwrapping that bandage. It's for the doctor that was thinking he was getting ready to have to cut somebody's foot off. My God. Our God is awesome. I don't see how you could be down or depressed because it is no way we lose in this thing. We win. We have already won. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. I don't know where everybody is today. We got a lot of, a lot of people that aren't here, but um, I'm glad you're here. Praise God. Praise God. And I'm glad for those of you that are worshiping with us online. I am glad that you are with us as well. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All week, um, I've been praying a, a single thing. We, uh, our administrative eldership, um, met this week. And so, you know, when we come together, we spend time just trying to tap into the the thing that God is saying, the thing that God is desiring to do 
through us and in this house. And so every year when we hit just about this time of the year, it's really an interesting period um, because most of the time this is the same season that we vision. And so what, what I mean by that is this is also the period of time where we have come together, uh, the full eldership, and we've talked about vision, where are we going, what do we need to be prepared for. And it's interesting that at the same time that we vision, it is also a time in just the rhythm of the church that people for some reason are less faithful in their giving. So it's it's, it's a deep kind of dynamic because on one side, you're getting excited about the future. Then on the other side, you're saying, okay, how are we going to do these things that you've called us to do? And God has called us to do some amazing things, and soon we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But, um, you know, I think what happens is I think that people, they, they're just engaged in the business, busyness of life, and then as summer comes... Everybody has been working on their summer body, you know, and everybody wants to go on vacation and all of that. And unfortunately, what can happen is we can, in the midst of doing all of those things, we can lose sight of just the priority of our relationship with God. That the reason you're able to do some of the things that you're able to do, the only reason is because of God's love for you and his care for you and his protection and his provision. I know that you think you, you work and that's where your money comes from, but let me tell you something. God is the source. He's the source. Everything else in life is a resource. And here's the good news. If you lost that job, God would still sustain you. And so it's just always important for us to just keep our priorities in line. I want you to look at somebody and say, keep your priorities in line. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to say something that I, I'm going to be real honest. I wrestled all week with saying this. And the reason that I'm, I wrestled with it is because, you know, there are times when the Lord will prompt you to say something that is prophetic. And, I mean, it's not, it's not general prophecy. It's like one of those prophecies where, okay, this is going to show up on you if it don't happen. And, and it's not just for that reason that, that I struggled with this. It's because I don't want to be misinterpreted in what I'm getting ready to tell you. So this week, I had this moment of encounter with the Lord. And of course, a lot is going on in our nation surrounding this election. And so I'm, you know, every day I, I have a prayer regiment and I pray for our nation every day. So I'm in this moment, and the Lord reminds me of something that I, that I spoke, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but during the pandemic, when I was doing the Friday stream, and in one of those Friday streams, I don't remember which one it was, but one of the things that I prophetically said is that the Lord said, if we don't reverse our direction as a nation that by 2025 we were going to end up in civil war and so I was in this prayer moment with the Lord and he reminded me of what he spoke to me and then the Lord said to me because it it sort of startled me but then the Lord said to me that he said this will be a civil war of ideas. Of ideas. So I don't want anybody to think I'm prophesying. We're getting ready to take up arms against each other. But what he did say to me that was extremely significant, he said that in 2025, our country 
will go into a true constitutional crisis. So I'm saying it. I pray that it doesn't happen. So it's not like when God says that, then it's like, okay, that's going to happen. We have the opportunity to pray. Um, but the reason I'm raising that is it, it is in connection to what God has called us to do as a people. The Lord was saying to me, it doesn't matter who wins this election. He wasn't saying it's going to be a constitutional crisis if this person wins or that person wins. God was making a point, and as I dug into that thing, what I want you to understand is that as a body of believers, and I'm talking now uh, across our country, as a body of believers, I think that we have lost our alignment with God. And I think on some level, the political has taken such deep, such a deep rooting in the body of Christ that for many, the political is becoming their God. And this is not, I, I want you guys to vote your heart. I'm not telling you who to vote for or anything like that. This is not about supporting a particular candidate. This is totally about where your priorities are in your life and you understanding that you are the salt you are the light and you can wait for some person to come on the scene that's going to make your life better as a believer God will make your life better and I, I really I want you to hear this from the bottom of my heart we never lose We, we don't lose. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. We don't lose. And we have, to, we have to maintain that focus on what our assignment is in the earth. Praise God. Praise God. We have to, we have to remain focused on what our assignment is. And, and we are salt and light in the earth. Praise God. And I love that. The, th that word salt in scripture, it, it actually comes from a Latin word. And it, it's a Latin word that we get the word salary from. So when God says you're the salt of the earth, he's, just, he's not simply talking about the preservative value of salt. Salt can preserve things, but he's saying you are the resource that I've put in the world. Praise God. You're the resource. And that's why he wants to bless you. That's why he wants to strengthen your life and strengthen your finances and do all of those things because I'm telling you, we're gonna hit a point in this country where people are going to once again understand their desperate need for God and they're gonna understand the value and the significance of the church. So that was a long, a long way of saying a number of things. But the most important thing is let's, let's, let's be faithful to the covenant and to the promise that we've made to God. Let's be faithful in our stewardship. Amen? Let's, let's be joyous givers. Let's... Let's, let's try God at his word. Let's, let's believe that as we sow into kingdom work, kingdom ministry, our kids are coming back together. The teens are coming back together. There are so many things that uh, we're just believing God for, and we need you to be faithful in order for us to achieve those things. Praise God. So if you're here or if you're worshiping with us online, you know, if you made a commitment and you faltered in your commitment, don't feel like you blew it. The grace of God gives us another chance. And I'm glad that he's not a God of a second chance, but he's the God of another chance. 
because Lord knows if we only had two. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So let's just be faithful. Would you stand to your feet? If you're worshiping with us online, they're going to put all the ways that you can give up on the screen. And we thank God <clears throat> for you being faithful as well. Father, we just bless you and we thank you for the privilege of giving right now. I thank you for every person who has cut covenant with this house, but more importantly has cut covenant with you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, that you have sustained us every step of the way. And so as we give today, we give not simply as an act of obedience, but it's deeper than that for us. We give as an expression of our love. We love you. We love you. And God, if nothing else, just let this gift say, we love you. And so, Lord, we repent if we have, if we have been slothful, if we've not been faithful in our stewardship. We repent for that, and we say we're sorry. But today, God, we commit to realign ourselves. And I thank you that this gift and this offering will speak to you today. It will speak to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on and bring your gift. Praise God.
jiggiest joints we got. That's one of my favorites. I really appreciate uh, just the, the atmosphere of worship and just the freedom in worship. And um, man, I, it's like that's been the theme so far this morning is is freedom and really just highlighting how much God deserves our praise, right? Like he really does. He's really, he's done all the heavy lifting <laughs> and he's made it like, he's just gracious like that, you know, just the way that he, the way that he set us up. So we exalt you, Lord, because you deserve the highest praise, God. We worship you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, worship team. Praise God for the worship team. I just be thinking about stuff like this. I be thinking about stuff like this. Like if we didn't have a worship team, right? Can you imagine just how awkward that would be? Because then we would have to hear ourselves sing. You know what I mean? We would have to hear our own voices giving him the highest praise. And that's not the most beautiful sound for some of us. You know? I believe in truth. You know what I mean? <laughs> Man, I'm blessed to be able to, um, to be able to dive into this word with you guys because a lot of, a lot of what God has had us diving into, um, in many ways, it's just been Him revealing Himself in new ways and expanding on our perspective of Him, and it's been. Uh, it's really been eye-opening for me personally the last several months, just the way that God has been opening up his word. Um, so I'm excited for the word this morning, and it's, it's, crazy how much, um, it's crazy how much we've already talked about freedom uh, this morning, because in a lot of ways, that was a, a big part of what God was putting on my heart uh, for us for today. So uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into uh, his word and... Man, God is, even with what you said, short man, <laughs> even what you said, um, just about, like, God refreshing and renewing our perspective of him. Like, there's just some ways where we maybe have lost sight of, of his heart and his priority. And the way that, even the way that we have interpreted freedom in a lot of ways, we can we can lose God's definition of freedom, right? Because we can talk about being free and create a scenario in our minds of what that looks like. Like for me to be free, it looks like, you know, this much money in my bank account, it looks like this in the dynamic of my relationships, it looks like this in my career. And we can kind of create this definition of freedom that doesn't necessarily match God's desire for the way that he wants to free us up. And uh, as he comes and he says, like, hey, let me correct your perspective on this. That's, that's just another example of his love because he loves us too much to leave us with incorrect perspective of him and his heart. Does that make sense? So praise God for a God who loves us too much to, to leave us in the dark. Thank you, Lord, for that. So one second. If this is your first time at Petra, man, are you in for it? <laughs> because, <laughs> because I don't know why they keep um, giving me the microphone, but for whatever reason, uh, God keeps allowing me to, to be used as his vessel to speak his word. And it's not because of me. Let's get that out the way. It's not, it's not because of me. It's not because I have... Uh, accomplish some level like in karate you know how you go up to the different belts it's not like I have you know reached this third degree black belt in his word and now I'm allowed to to speak it's that he is allowing me to use uh, our relationship me and him to to open up his word in a way and make it applicable and prayerfully there's something that 
that you get that applies to your life through the way that, that he moves through the word. So we have been talking uh, last week about this foundational scripture of this house, which is found in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, uh, we see where we get our name, right? We see where we get our name. Can we go there? Can we go to Matthew 16? And even now, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence, God. I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill the room. I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill me, Lord, and that only your word would be released, Lord. I ask that anything that is in me that would get in the way of your perfect will, Lord, burn it out in Jesus' name. And I ask that, that your word would come forth because that's where freedom and breakthrough and healing comes from, Lord, that we will never be the same if your word is what is released, Lord. So we just welcome you in this place and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Jesus asked the question to, the, to his disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers in verse 16. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. We'll keep going to 19. I can read it from here for y'all. Let's do that because I'm being impatient this morning. The Steelers don't play till 4.30, so we got time. I don't have to be in a rush. You know? Praise God for the Steelers being undefeated. Steelers are undefeated right now. So this is what it says. Simon Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the son of God. And Jesus answers and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter upon this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So God, uh, he names this place Petra, right? And and this is not, uh, this is not a... Petra focused word. The, the Bible is not about Petra. The Bible is about God, right? And, and what he can do is he can use names and places and scenarios to teach us something about what he wants to do inside of us. So it's not insignificant that he would name this place Petra because he says in Matthew 16 that it's upon this rock that I'm going to build my church. So what rock is he talking about? We talked about this last week. He says, Petra represents, and not just this location, but what he's saying it in scripture, Petra represents a place where I come into a revelation of who God is. That's why he says, who, who do you say that I am? I come into a revelation of who God is, and that results in me seeing a revelation of who God says that I am. Okay? So the keys to the kingdom to, to forbid or to permit uh, here on earth as it is in heaven, all these things are related to a, a people who know who God is and who God has then revealed who we are. Does that make sense? Okay. So what God is doing is he starts talking to us and saying, hey, I want to I change your perspective on the thing. I want you to see this differently. I want you to be able to uh, recognize the areas where I am bringing correction to our, our heart's posture. We talked about soil last week, talking about our heart's posture. What God is, is doing in this time, in, in many ways, is it's almost like a spiritual version of LASIK. You know, LASIK, the, the laser eye surgery, it's like a corrective vision surgery. It's like God is doing spiritual LASIK on his body, where he is... He is correcting our perspective so that we can see him clearly because he knows that if we see him clearly and he's put in his proper place, then he can entrust to us the keys to the kingdom. He can, he can show us who we are and give us the ability to go out and, and conquer and subdue the earth the way that we're supposed to. So there is this, this spiritual clarity that we're just going to keep seeing uh, be enhanced as we, as we stay on the operating table and we allow God to do what it is that, that he's desiring to do, okay? 
Okay. So when we see God clearly, we, we see ourselves clearly, and that's how we get to kingdom. So last week we talked about good soil, and in good soil, we, what God really showed us was that there's these, um, there are these elements of our, of our perspective. There's these elements of our heart's posture that God has to correct so that we can uh, be effective in our faith. Because when we bring a heart's posture um, that is not good soil, then we saw these different things that happen when God's word is deposited, right? We saw how the enemy is able to steal God's word from us. We saw how how we can uh, we can experience things in life that kind of burn out God's word and like cause His word in us to wither and die because it can't withstand the the pain and the suffering that life throws at us. We saw uh, God's word being able to be choked out in our life because we get distracted and we get worried about things that are not his heart's priority. But then we saw good soil, right? And we saw how uh, if we allow God to do this, this heart surgery, that we can be good soil where his word is deposited and we, we stick with it. We cling to it throughout pain and persecution and suffering. We stick with it. And in due time, we, we bring fruit. Does that make sense? So, so there is this, there is this freedom that comes with just allowing God to change us the way that He sees fit, not the way that I want to be changed. Like I have the ways that I want God to change me. Starting with my height, I would like to be six foot four. I would like for God to do a miraculous thing in my kneecaps and stretch them right. And that's the way that I would like for God to, to change me, right? But he has something in my heart that he wants to change that is a completely different uh, priority list than what I would change about me. And I have to be careful. I have to make sure that I don't get so caught up in the areas of me and others that I think God should change that I miss the opportunities of what he wants to change in me. Okay, so we're going to look at Galatians today um, to really help us to, to unpack this concept of freedom and what God is doing in this time. And, and Galatians is this letter that Paul is writing. And in many ways, it's like a corrective letter. Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians to correct some false teaching that has really hindered their growth in their relationship with God because uh, they've got some faulty perspective that has been taught to them, okay? And, you know, God is is teaching us even right now through the letter. He's teaching us to stop allowing life circumstances to determine how we see him, right? So if God is good, then he's good. And if he's not, then he's not. We got to kind of make a decision, right? And we got to stand on that. Because uh, when we start to adopt these little faulty ideas of, well, I think he's good, but then this happens, and I'm not sure if he's good to me, right? If we allow these little faulty uh, perspectives to sneak in, then we miss where God is trying to take us, okay? So we have to learn to use his word uh, to, to assess how to properly give him the glory that he is due no matter the circumstances, okay? So in this letter to the Galatians, we're gonna start in, in uh, chapter five, and this is just a good book just to read, just in general, right? It's just a good book to read. But in chapter five, we're gonna just roll through this together. This is gonna be a little bit of an unorthodox Sunday, right? Because you got some permission, there's some freedom in the room for us to just kind of, let's just talk through his word together, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to specific places, but we'll start uh, here in, in verse 2. So <clears throat> it says, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. We're going to go to verse 6. No, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to read through from 2 to six. Let me be more clear in my communication. I apologize, Ms. Ramona. Paul says, I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. 
for if you're trying to make yourselves right with God. So here's, here's where we get out of, like, take the whole concept of circumcision and expand it, right? It's not just talking about circumcision as we know it. So Paul expands. He says, this is what I mean by if you're trying to be right with God through circumcision. If you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, by doing everything right, by being the perfect Christian, by having the right answer to everything. If you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've already been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. But... We who live by the Spirit, say by the Spirit, we eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness, the right position with God that he has promised us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Okay, so let's let's walk through this together. There's this group. There's this religious group that has come behind Paul to these believers that he's writing the letter to. And they've already accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they're in. They're in. Okay, then there's this group that comes behind Paul and says, well, you're not really in in because you don't do these things. You don't keep Mosaic law. You're not circumcised. You're like all of these things. They had this list of things that they said, you're almost in. You're almost there. If you just do a couple more things, then God will bless you. If you just like you're almost saved enough to grab the promise that God has for you when you read his word, but you're not quite there yet. For some of us, this is what stops us from reading our word consistently. Because we it's a perspective that you start reading the word and you're like, I must just not be saved enough because I'm not really understanding how this applies. I'm not really fully getting it. It doesn't seem applicable. It doesn't work for me. Right? There's this perspective that happens as, we're, as we are walking our lives out where in some ways these ideas have come behind our salvation and said, you're not quite there yet. Okay? So Paul is writing this letter, and if you read this letter, Paul is hot. Like if you actually, if you go back and you kind of read it, Paul says some spicy stuff in the letter to Galatians where he's like letting it be known like, man, this is ridiculous. Like this idea is ridiculous. And he, he uses uh, circumcision because that was one of the, the primary weapons that they were using to exclude this people from being considered Christ followers, right? So he's like, if what you're trying to do is use circumcision to count yourself as in, and you've been cut off from Christ and, and you've been you've fallen away from grace. Okay? You guys all right? All right. If you weren't, would you tell me? All right. I gotta ask the question. You know what I mean? Like, would you tell me? Are we there? Okay. <laughs> so Paul says some deep things. He says stuff like, man, basically, like it was Christ's choice to buy my freedom with his life. So it's my choice to stay free. <laughs> like if he bought my freedom with his life, I'm going to choose to stay free. I'm not going to choose to lock myself back up after he already paid the price for my freedom based on what any of y'all are saying is the requirement. God already set us free. Okay, so there is this perspective within the body that you have to do the right things. And what that does is it that is your ticket to a painless life. A, a suffering free life 
is bought by you doing the right things. The reason why that is bad theology is number one, it's not biblical. But number two, it's because now what does that do to us when we, when we experience suffering or pain? If we're experiencing suffering or pain, now it, it puts our salvation back in the question mark. Are we actually saved if we're experiencing these extremely difficult things in life? At the moment that you say, man, if I do the right things, then I, I get a pain-free life with God. That's not what he promises. Now, he promises a pain-free eternity. But we're on this side of heaven right now. So if we adopt this perspective that, like, I can buy a painless life by doing the right things, then it's a slippery slope. And what Paul teaches is that you are actually, you are, you are counting what Christ did at the cross, you are counting it as not good enough. You're saying that that's not enough. You're saying that God putting down his perfection and packaging himself into a human body, and he didn't put down his perfection. Let me correct that. God putting his perfection into a human body in coming to earth and living a sinless life and then choosing that what he was going to do with that sinless life was he was going to use that as the ransom to pay for my busted self, like my busted decisions, the stuff that I have done that was just dumb, wrong, didn't make any sense. This is me. This isn't y'all. All right, y'all are holy, <laughs> okay? Me, I got a different life story, right? But the fact that he took his perfect sinless life and decided to, to subject himself to torture and to being spit on by the people who's, who his breath was in their lungs, like, he, he allowed people to use the breath that he placed in their lungs to curse him and to spit on him. And he allowed all this to happen to pay for the mistakes that I was going to make. Now, for me to say that that's not good enough, that's a deep posture and position to take and we don't view self-condemnation as like that deep of a decision. We, we look at it like, well, I did mess up in this way, and maybe God does not desire to do these things in my life because I still got to get these things right. That is, that is an extremely prideful position to take because it's saying that I am so important and my sin is so big that the creator of the universe giving up his life isn't enough to pay for it. And that's a bold statement and position to take, right? So Paul's like, we got to shed some light on this, and we got we to gotta get rid of this perspective, okay? And he, let's take a, a quick detour. Can we jump to uh, Ephesians chapter 2? There's a, there's a specific way that he states this in Ephesians that's very, that was very helpful to me, right? It says in Ephesians God saved you by his grace when you believed, okay? He saved you by his grace when you got it right. He saved you by his grace when you started doing everything right. He saved you by his grace when you switched all your decisions and everything looked crystal clean. No, it says that he saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God, yeah. right? So salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So, so he puts it very plain and clear, and he's like, look, you can't, you can't take any credit for being in, right? And therefore, you know, nobody can take that credit away from you and say that you're out. 
It's a gift that God has given at the moment that you chose to place your belief and your faith in Christ. Right? So there's this tagline, saved by grace through, through faith in Christ Jesus. Right? That's just something that should just be constantly in your mind when the enemy or anyone allows himself to be used by the enemy to try to accuse and, and try to um, bring definition as to why God's promise does not apply to you. Saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus saved by grace through works through faith in my ability to make the right decision through faith in Christ Jesus okay this can seem very elementary but there's a reason why God is having us to to go back and look at this and and reestablish kind of this new foundation so that as he's building out his kingdom, there is, there is uh, stability. Because there are things that God is about to do, and there are things that God is going to allow in the coming season that if we do not have a stable and firm foundation of what his word says and what his heart's posture is and how he feels about us and what he's done for us, then what he's about to do, it will, it will cause, the Bible tells us, a great falling away. We're in the middle right now of a portion of that great falling away. There are so many people who are falling away from their faith in Christ Jesus because of these foundational beliefs that were not laid properly. So it doesn't surprise me when I go on Facebook and I see another person uh, denouncing and deconstructing their faith. That doesn't surprise me. It hurts my heart, but it doesn't surprise me because his word told me it was going to happen. Okay, he talks about him shaking everything that can be shaken. Okay, so we're experiencing that right now. That is happening right now. And we can't be so hard hearted that we ignore it. And we can't be so sensitive that we are just offended by the audacity of someone to, to throw away their faith. Well, no, God says that's going to happen, which is why we need this. Okay, we need this perspective. So, so Paul writes that we are saved by grace through, through faith in Christ Jesus so that no one can boast and essentially so that the kingdom is available to everyone. Okay, because that group that had come behind him to the Galatians, they were carrying this uh, religious elitism that because they were uh, Jews who God gave the law to that that meant that they were somehow higher in the pecking order when it came to kingdom and when it came to relationship with God. No different than pastors or elders or deacons or ministers or people with titles in the church can view a congregation as though there's something lower about the congregation in comparison to having a title in the church. The, the deep thing about God's word, pause, sorry, we just talking, y'all, we just talking, lighten up, chill, relax, <laughs> relax, all right? The deep thing about God's word is that if you go back and you look at what we're named, if you go to that foundational scripture in Matthew 16, he talks about giving the keys of the kingdom, and he talks about whatever we bind or loose on earth will be, it will be in he as that same way in heaven, right? So what that word tells me is that there is nothing that is allowed to function within our territory that we have not allowed in. Okay? So there's nothing... There is no perspective, there is, no, there is nothing, there is no ideology, there is no preference that is allowed to function in this territory 
that we do not have the authority to kick out or allow to stay in and tell it to kick up his shoes and relax his feet, right? So we, we have to take accountability for that, okay? So there are, let's just read it. Let's just read it. There's this idea that there's this idea that there should be more ways to get to God other than through the Son. Right? There's this idea that like that's harsh, God. Like there's just one way to get to the Father and it's through the Son. You know, what about what about this or what about that? What about me being able to do this? Or what about the person who's you know, in a remote, I don't know why they're always in a remote village in this conversation. They're never in East Hills. It's never, what about the person on Wilner? It's always, what about the person in the village where there's no antennas? I, we in East Hills, so we're going to talk about where God has us. And then as he sheds light on what the strategy is for the village, we want to send miracle. I'm not going. We're going to send miracle <laughs> to the village. And she's going to be popping. It's going to be 4 a.m. And she's, you're going to think it's 4 p.m. Because she's going to be live. All right? I will be asleep. Okay? So there's this idea that, that's, that like, God is, is harsh for only giving us one way to him. And that when we hear things like the wages of sin is death, there's this idea that like, well, that's harsh, God. The only reason why we think that that's harsh is because we haven't really digested the concept of a holy God. Like if we digested his holiness and how offensive and filthy our sin nature is to a holy God, we wouldn't be saying, Dad, God, that's the only way. We would be saying, thank you for making a way. Like, a way at all to have my relationship restored to you as my heavenly father. Thank you for creating a way and for not keeping it a secret. Like, you didn't just give us a way, but like, you made it accessible. You made the path accessible. Now it's a narrow one. It's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge the way that we look at suffering, and it's going to challenge the way that we look at interactions with others and, and love and, and kindness and pain and joy and the things that he tells us later on in Galatians. We'll see if we get there today. We're, we're on the right track. We might get there. Okay. But it's going to challenge our perspective in those, in those areas. Right. So we only, you know, we only view God as harsh when we're not looking at him through the proper lens of his holiness. Okay. And his perfection. And I don't know about you, but if I were God, I'm not coming down here with y'all dusty, <laughs> rusty, musty selves. If I were God, I'm not God, right? If I were God, I'd be like, I'm not coming down there. Some of y'all don't even wear deodorant. I'm not about to come down there with y'all. Y'all took that personal. Don't take it personal if you wear deodorant. If you don't, then let, let them use you. We're just talking, y'all. We're just wor working through his word together. Because we have to, we have to. If we're, going, if we're going to function in the world that he has placed us in, and if we're going to take territory and we're going to prepare his people for his return, we got to go through his word. He, that's what's happening, y'all. That's what this says. He's coming back. And when he comes back, it gets really ugly before it gets pretty. And if we, if we say that we love him and each other, then we have a duty to go through this and to prepare. Okay? So let's jump back to, uh, let's jump back to Galatians because, and, and go back to, I think it's verse 6 where we stopped. Because it talks about, in verse 6, um, it talks about love, 
that that there's an element of our faith that is played out uh, through love. So that's six, right? Yes, faith which worketh by love. So God has this, he has this uh, element of himself that is love. We have a word. He has a an attribute or a part of himself that, you know, that he is this thing in its perfected state, love. And then we have a word that we say and that when we hear it, we do weird things. Like, oh, he said love. So now I can do all these things. Y'all, are y'all alive? Is that not what happens? Or is it just super uncomfortable because we're talking about it? We got, this, we got this word that gets thrown out there like a big joker, and it gets thrown out there, and now all of a sudden, we start acting real different. But God is love. Like, it's not a word. It is a part of who he is in its fullness and in its purest state and in its true definition, right? So he has this, this love and, and in its true definition, love is unconditional. There are no um, parameters to God's love. It is endless. It's what would make him do what only he could do, which is come to earth and fulfill his own law and then willingly suffer death on a cross to pay for those who he loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? And he made the path so easy that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life, right? So that is a path that I could have never chiseled out for myself because it had to start with coming and living a perfect life. So we could have never chiseled that path out for ourselves. He comes and does it and then makes the path accessible, okay? Now that faith that we are to put in him to access the path, it's supposed to, um, I don't know why we're in Ephesians 5, 6. We should be in Galatians 5, 6. Thank you so much, Ms. Ramona. That's my, my teacher, y'all, Ms. Ramona. So she loves me, so I could say, that's the wrong scripture because she loves me, all right? And she is expressing it in love, all right? It says, what is important is that the faith that is to be placed in Christ Jesus is expressed how? It's supposed to be expressed in love. Okay, so what does that, what does that really mean and what does that look like? We have to get that definition from God. Now, for the next several verses, we don't have to um, go through them all, read them at home, but through verses 7 through 15, what Paul talks about is basically, I'm summarizing, Anything other than the idea that you are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, anything other than that is false teaching. Stay away from it. That's what he says. Okay. And he says, live in freedom, but deny your sinful nature and serve one another in love. So live in freedom, but deny your sin nature. So go to verse uh, 13, please. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Jump to verse 16. I'm jumping verses because we got to be done by four. So... (laughs) so i say let the holy spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So stay back, stay back there for a second. So Paul is like, he's calling out 
all the things that we don't like talking about. He's like, look, you are free. Don't let anybody come and put you back in a box where you put these handcuffs back on. You're free because your faith is in Christ Jesus, but that faith has to be walked out in love. Now, walking in freedom doesn't mean you just do whatever you want. He says, don't use your freedom to indulge in your sinful nature. Recognize that internally there is a sin nature, but now that you've accepted Christ, there is now a spirit nature, the Holy Spirit. And these two are at odds. Every day that I wake up, this is me. This ain't y'all. Relax. Unclench. You're okay. Every day that I wake up, there is a battle internally between my sin nature and the Holy Spirit inside of me. Every single day in however many decisions, I forget the, the, the study that says how many uh, choices we make and how many decisions we make throughout the course of a day. But every single day, I've got these thousands of choices that I'm making, and these choices are being made between my sin nature and the spirit nature. Inside of us all, there's this same internal battle. And right now, with where God has his people, pretty much everything that we decide to do on a daily basis is a decision to either lock arms and agree with the Holy Spirit or a decision to lock arms and agree with sin nature. We don't want to look at each decision that way. We want to find all different types of ways to justify what we want to do. But all of our decisions are locking arms with the Holy Spirit or locking arms with our sin nature. And when we are directed by the Holy Spirit, we, we are free from the obligations of the law. That's what it says in, in verse 18. Go one more verse. When I'm directed by the Holy Spirit, I'm free from the obligations of the law because... I'm, it's not that I'm free because I no longer sin. I'm free because my heart's posture toward my sin now aligns with the, the Father's heart. So I'm not, I'm not free from the law because I get it right and I'm free from the law because I no longer have to look at it or worry about it. It's that when I do something that is locking arms with the sin nature, my heart's posture toward what that does to the Father and to the fact that, Jesus, Dad, you pay for this, like even, like you pay for this too, like that turns my response to invite the Holy Spirit in to bring repentance, which is a changing of the way that I think, which resulted in the action, okay? So, again, somewhat elementary, but we got to we gotta lay this foundation. So I, I don't make excuses for sin, and I, and I don't try to call it something other than sin, right? Oh, well, that, well that's not sin. It's just if you wouldn't have, <laughs> like if you wouldn't have done what you did, then I wouldn't have been forced to respond the way that I know sin is sin. Okay? Sin that it sin, anything that does not align with God's will for my life and, and what the Holy Spirit is saying, it is sin. Okay? And it's a real short, easy three letter word, so it's easy to remember. Okay? It is sin. And I still do that. That still happens. Unfortunately, on this side of heaven, that still happens for me. Even though I have a microphone, that still happens. But I don't make an excuse for it, right? I can't make an excuse for it. What I have to do is I have to invite the Holy Spirit in to reveal what needs to be changed in my heart, right? Okay, God, that wasn't like you. What's happening inside of me that you're ready to change and address that caused that? And that process 
is that process is called sanctification. It's a fancy church word that means that salvation is a decision. Sanctification is a process of how that decision changes me over time. Does that make sense? So, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the process. Cause it, because he could have just made it, like you said, he could have just made it to where it's like, all right, you got one shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got one chance to get this thing right. And if you don't, you blew it. But he, he, he takes us into a process of sanctification. And what happens through sanctification is I discover God's viewpoint. I get that spiritual LASIK. I discover God's perspective. I discover his viewpoint. And then I make the decision to act on his divine perspective instead of my perspective. So God can reveal something and say, hey, son, this needs to change in your heart. And I could disagree. God, I don't really think that needs to change. I think that that's a protective method that keeps me safe. I don't really think that, you know, forgiveness is necessary in this situation because me keeping them where they're at is keeping me safe. So I can choose to lock arms with that perspective or I can choose to, to hear God's perspective through his word, through godly community. I can hear his perspective and choose to align with his perspective and invite the Holy Spirit in to change in me what needs changed. And, and not hold on to my, my sinful nature's desire to stay the same. That internal battle of sin and spirit, spirit wants to change us into the image of Christ. Sin wants to keep us the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Jump to, just go one more verse. quick three verses that I won't get stuck here, y'all. Say, Cam, don't get stuck. All right, we're going to keep it moving. So look, <laughs> when you follow the desires of your sermon, that's also very clear. We're going to do it like the, the, the medicine when they give you the side effects, all the things. That, these are the side effects of following your, your sinful nature. Headaches. Rectal bleeding? Why did, I don't want... Why do I got to take that? I just got a headache. But that's how it goes. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. But just in case, Paul says, I'll spell it out for you. <laughs> Sexual immorality. It's summed up because in God's sight, there is no difference between having sex with your boo that is um, that, that there is no covenant or commitment made he doesn't see that as any different whether it is same sex whether it's heterosexual he doesn't see any difference it's because it's a, God looks at the heart we don't like that idea that like there's a dif no there's a different no there's not there's not a difference between between sex outside of the context of a god ordained marriage god ordained bold letters hit the button to make it real big so it goes from like 16 to 24 size font God ordained marriage there's no there is no difference in God's sight because any time that sex happens outside of that container it forfeits all of the protective elements that God intended for what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to be used. The tricky part is it does not change the feeling in our flesh. 
right? That's the tricky part. What would be dope is if God said, oh, you ain't married, it ain't gonna feel good. That would have been, aha. That would have got him. He'd have been cooking with grease, right? That would have, that would have been, that would have been like, ah, I see what you did there, <laughs> right? But God didn't decide to do that, right? Because it's a, it's a heart posture that it takes to choose to not use our freedom to indulge in our sinful nature, right? So he says the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity. This is a big one now that we could spend weeks just talking about this. We, t we talked about it somewhat when purpose meets purity and, and just understanding that Christ is coming back for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle, right? So there is an element of purity that God desires for his body that speaks to the world that his body is in, okay? Say, Cam, don't get stuck. All right, lustful pleasures. Let's just let that be what it is. Okay, we're not gonna, you, we don't have to. It's okay, lustful pleasures. Okay, no, it's not okay. It's not okay, right? We don't act on lustful pleasures. And lust is not, that you see he did sexual immorality and he did lustful pleasures because lust is a heart's posture. It's, it's a heart's posture that wants to take based on what it will do for me with no reverence or respect or thought for what else happens as a result of that taking. Okay? Idolatry. Idolatry, we talked about that last week. Anything that can cause me to tell God no is an idol. If God says, son, I want you to do this right now. I want you to spend your time in your word. I want you to pray. I want you to, you know, go spend time with your wife. I want you to do this with your kid. I want you to do whatever God says to do. Anything that is my excuse to tell God, no, not right now. I'll do it in a minute, if at all. That, that is an idol, which means that there can be good things that I allow to take a position in my life that makes it an idol. So, like, for example... For, for me, for many years, money was an idol because, and I could justify it. I could make it real spiritual. Pull out your Bibles. Let me show you where it says, <laughs> right, that this is a part of my role. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what's supposed to happen within my household. But if, if the money is calling and what God is telling me to do is to spend time in his presence right now, or to pour into my kids right now, or to spend time with my wife, or to be doing something else other than going to work at that moment. And if I'm telling him, I'll do it when I get off work, now that money has become an idol, right? So, you know, it, ministry can become an idol. God, I'll do it, I, I'll get around to it, God, but I gotta be, you know, they got the deacons, ursers, breakfast brunch lunch that I'm serving at and I gotta be there at this time and God's like but I don't want you to drive past that person right there I want you to pull over the car and I want you to have an exchange with this person but God I gotta be here I'm but I'm a I'm a deacon ah uh, do you know what deacon means a deacon is a servant so who are you serving if you're telling me that you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do so that you can go and serve well now whatever you're serving has become an idol sorcery other uh, variations you'll see witchcraft magic medicine anything that is a shortcut past God's intended process is witchcraft and sorcery. So all you gotta do is take two of these and call me in the morning. If it's if it's skipping past, and I'm not saying, you know, stop your prescriptions, no. Go to Johnny, go get what the doctor told you to get so that you are 
here tomorrow. What I'm saying is a heart's posture that says that I can skip past God's intended process and I can just get the result, even if you get it, what's attached to that is a spirit. And that is sorcery or witchcraft. Hostility and quarreling, let's just say election season. Let's just sum those two up and put them in a package for the next two months. And that's what we're gonna say. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, there is such an anger, there is such a spirit of anger inside of the world right now, but specifically in our kids. There is such an anger that is a strategic uh, attack of the enemy on our children, but on all, it's not, it's not even just our children because there, there is this element of anger that is consuming that in many ways is connected to things that we're so far removed from and we done built so many calluses and protective methods to not have to think about it that we don't even, we don't even recognize what it's connected to anymore. This is all a part of indulging in the sinful nature. Selfish ambition. See, somebody told you, no, nah, you're just a shark. You just, get, you just got this business, man. You're just a shark out there, and this is what you're supposed to be. No, selfish ambition is a heart's posture that, that pulls us away from caring about the things that God cares about. Dissension and division, okay? One more verse. Paul said it's obvious, and then he's going to say all this. Okay, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, basically Cam's life in the 90s and early 2000s. Okay, let's just wrap that up and just say Cam in 06 to like 2011. All right, if you scroll far enough on Facebook, if you just keep going like this, I didn't delete it. If you just keep going like this, you'll get to it. You'll be like, oh, there it is. There it is right there. You get down to just a whole bunch of like, Young Jeezy lyrics, and it just gets weird. But it's still there. This is like a history project for my daughter. She can do a history project on it. And just in case I didn't hit yours, other sins like these. <laughs> Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we can't live kingdom lives if we are ruled by our desires. God does not say you will no longer have the desire. I was having this conversation uh, a couple days ago somewhere. Like, it's not that, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if y'all can handle this truth. What time is it? Oh, yeah, we good. 12.23. Two more minutes. Look, I don't, I don't not smoke weed anymore because I just all of a sudden stopped wanting to. That's not the reason why. Okay? Transparency. She said, hold on, sit, sit tight. <laughs> right? Because this prescription... <laughs> Plausible deniability. I see what you did there. I said, yeah, yeah, good job, Bishop. <laughs> so like it wasn't it, it's not that that desire just went away okay it's that God revealed that this thing had a stronghold in how I handle pressure how I handle suffering how I handled all the elements of my life that were uncomfortable, this thing had gotten into his seat. Right? So when he reveals like, hey, this thing's sitting in my chair. Right? It's not that I just woke up the next day and I just didn't have the thought or the desire. That's not how it works. There are still times right now where I put the Stiller game on and I'm like, y'all are stressing me out. 
I need to roll a J because y'all are stressful. Like it is, that was not a good decision, <laughs> right? So it's not that the desire just goes away. It's that the heart's posture has changed where it's like, okay, now God has made me aware that now to do this thing, guess what? This is going to mess you up. I'm still in the kingdom if I did it. That's going to jack some people's whip up with, you know, how you get your kids to do what you want them to do. Is you going to hell? And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to do the thing. So you can change the behavior, but not the heart. So here's the thing. Even if I still did it, I'm still in as long as I still have put my faith in Christ Jesus. But what it has revealed in me is that there is a response, there is a heart posture in me that does not align with the Father's. And he died for me to not have to run to this like he paid for this process to be between him and I and not between me and this thing. Does that make sense? Okay. He names all these things in 19 through 21 and, and you know what really stood out to me is that when he's naming all these things, drunkenness and wild parties and uh, you know, all the things that we just went through. When he's naming all these things, the world defines these things as freedom. Like that's what the world says it looks like to be free. Go ahead and do all the things. You're young, live your life, just go and do it. And the person who's saying that has like great grandchildren. And I'm like, but you're, but you're not, you told me I'm young, but what's your excuse? So if it don't, that's not the way that the kingdom works. There's not a list of things that apply to me at this age that don't apply to the other person or the younger person. So if it can't, if the, if the message can't go every which way, if I got to change the message, then it doesn't work. So I said, okay, this is what, but this is what the world defines as freedom. Paul defines it as spiritual slavery. So all the things that we are chasing or that we are going after that we say are making us feel free are, are binding our hands. And it's exactly what the enemy is then going to use to try to condemn you and tell you that you're out. So this concept of freedom, which is what we started with today, this concept of freedom is important for God to, to define this for us. And this is where we'll stop. Go, go to verse 22 and pull it up in the uh, New King James Version. Yeah, in the King James, that's good. So we're familiar with this. So Paul says, hey, here is what living life through your sinful nature and locking arms with that looks like. Now, let me describe to you what it looks like to lock arms with the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit. First of all, that word fruit is talking about results. Right? So he says the results of a Holy Spirit surrendered life are, check out the list, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, <gasps> meekness, temperance against such there is no law. Okay? So love, joy, peace, uh, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says against such there is no law. So the results of a spirit-led life are consistent regardless of the circumstances that we're in and the responses of other people. So he doesn't say you have to function with love, joy, all these things when people do the right thing. As a matter of fact, it's, it is only, uh, these characteristics only are effective in leading people to Christ and glorifying God when they are displayed in the midst of an opportunity to do the opposite. So when someone is super kind and loving toward me, for me to love them back, the Bible says, well, anybody could do that, right? So if the fruit of the spirit of love, it's love in the face of someone being unlovable. 
if the fruit of the spirit is joy, it's joy in the face of a circumstance and a situation that it would make all the sense in the world for me to have despair and sadness. If it's peace, you see what you see how God shows us like the reason why it's the fruit of the spirit and the reason why it draws us closer to him and glorifies him is because it's it's being displayed in the midst of chaos. So when we talk about where our world is, when we talk about where our personal lives are, all of these situations and circumstances are, are opportunities for us to lock arms with the Holy Spirit and let him develop this fruit or lock arms with our sin nature. And we already read that book and watched the movie and we already know what that looks like. I do. I got the shirt, as you said, Miss Robin. I got the postcard, the the headband, and the do rag because it was early 2000s. It was a weird time. We wore a lot of stuff on our heads. Headband, do rag, fitted bandana, a lot, all at one time, right? So I got everything to show for these things, right? So I know what that gets me. But locking arms with the spirit results in a different type of fruit. Now. I believe God is going to, he's going to expound on this, and, and we're going to unpack some of these fruits of the Spirit, Lord willing, next week, if that's his will. That's what we'll do. Amen? Okay, stand to your feet. You coming up? Mm -hmm. What a word, what a word, what a word. Boy, I just love the way that the Lord um, expresses his word through Cameron. Um, it's just extremely powerful. One of the biggest tools that the enemy uses to incarcerate the people of God is condemnation, guilt, and shame. And we're, we're at a time in our lives where the Lord is really restoring what was lost in the Garden of Eden. When, when we're introduced to Adam and Eve, it tells us that they were naked, but they were not ashamed. And it's such a powerful picture of the restoration of God in our lives that we recognize that we're naked. We recognize that we're, we're not perfect. But through the finished work of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be ashamed. Whew. Thank you, Lord. It is truly, it is truly a picture of the restoration that the Father is bringing into your life, bringing into my life. And it's something about walking that out in the earth that becomes healing to the people that are around you. I mean, every <clears throat> expression of healing is not someone laying hands on you and, you know, quoting scripture. There's a healing that can come from your presence because you're walking in the revelation of the redemption that you've received through Jesus Christ. And one thing that I'm learning about freedom is that freedom is contagious. When you get around someone and th that spirit of guilt and shame is not on them and they're free and they're loving God, it's something about that person's presence that's compelling to you. Something that that makes you desirous to have that. And that's the witness that God wants to release through your life and through my life in the earth. And so if you're watching this by way of stream or if you're in this place in a moment, I'm going to invite you to respond to the word that's been released. But before I do that, I just want us to take a moment and begin to thank God once again for the freedom that we have through Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Mm. 
Where would I be? Only you know. <laughs> I'm glad you see through eyes of love. I'd be a hopeless case, an empty place, if not for grace amazing grace how sweet the sound I once was lost but now I'm found I was a hopeless case An empty place until grace. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Mm, glory, hallelujah. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior. He ransomed me. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes I can just get overwhelmed thinking about just the grace, the patience of God. Listen, if, if you're here this morning and you've not made a commitment to the Lord, or even beyond that, I just feel like the word that's been released is designed to cause people that have been living in the margins. It's like you've been on the periphery. You've been, it's not that you don't love God, but you've just been sort of just not all the way in. And I believe that a huge part of what this word is designed to do is to pull you in to help you to understand that you don't have to live out there in the margins. You don't have to live waking up feeling good about yourself one day and feeling bad about yourself the next. You don't have to live in that cycle. And so I'm gonna pray, but I'm telling you, the Father is here to break those chains off of you today, to truly give you liberty, to truly give you freedom. And if you're watching by way of stream today, someone will come out and minister to you. But I'm telling you, today is a day where God is like he's calling his family closer. He's calling his sons and daughters closer. He's saying, come closer. If you've never made a commitment to him, don't leave out of this place disconnected from the Father. But let this be the day that something inside of you says, no, I'm not, devil, you're not robbing me of life anymore. I'm receiving him as my Lord and Savior. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the salvation that has been purchased through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And God, I thank you that by your spirit, you draw us unto yourself. I thank you that there is nothing powerful enough to stand in between you and your people. So we declare in this moment by your spirit that every chain is broken. We declare that every obstacle is removed, whether it is an obstacle of circumstance or an obstacle that's in the mind. We break every barrier and we declare that this is our time of freedom. This is our time of renewal. This is our time of deliverance. This is our time of salvation. This is our time of restoration. And God, we're claiming it because you purchased it. Now, Father, I just thank you for drawing that person that's been on the sidelines, that's, that's been on the periphery of this thing. I thank you for drawing them in closer. I thank you for bringing that son, that daughter in closer. I thank you for breaking depression off of that mother. I thank you, God, for breaking that spirit of hopelessness off of that young person. And I thank you that right now, liberty and freedom reigns in this atmosphere. And so God, 
as only you can, as only you can, save today in Jesus' name. If I'm talking to you, I want you to come very quickly. I want you to come very quickly. What a powerful word that we heard, and even what Bishop was just saying. You know, the, the scripture that is just resonating in my spirit, who the sun sets free, is free indeed. And we're just inviting you today that even like Bishop was just saying, that maybe you haven't made a commitment yet, or maybe you're half in or you're not sure, just the things of life have kind of made you go this way or that way. Just know, like just what Bishop said, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus is all about forgiveness. Jesus is all about restoration. Jesus is all about redeeming and restoration. And so today we just want to invite you that maybe you've been in a hard place. Maybe you've been in a pit. And the one thing I know, and I've been in those places where I feel so far or so abandoned and just like, God, where are you? But one thing I love is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And the whole reason that he came down and he gave his life for us and he walked on the earth is because he understands the vicissitudes of life. He understands the hardships that we walk through, the things that we we deal with. And this is the day that we don't want you to go another day without him. We're not talking about a religion. We're talking about relationship because that's the difference. And so if this is your first time that maybe you just want to invite Jesus into your heart. Just take that moment. Just have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and be like, Jesus, I believe in you that you died and you rose again for my sins. I thank you, Jesus for what you're doing in my life. I thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Because if it wasn't for your grace, I don't know where I'd be. And you know what I love is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And something also that God recently, like even last, it was early in the morning that he just talked about, he is the bread of life. That it is so important for us to eat of him, to eat of his word, to be in his presence, to spend that time. Because when he begins when you begin to spend time in his presence, he begins to do something deep within our spirit and our soul to, to take out those infirmities, to take out those iniquities, to take out those things that are having us go astray because our heart is for you to be with him and to walk with him today. Well, we hope that this message, this encounter really strengthened your spirit, encouraged you, and that we believe that you're going to be a changed person, a renewed person, and you're going to walk in such a path that you're going to begin to see that fruit. Even when things come up against you, you'll see the fruit of God manifest in your life. We love you, family, and we'll see you next week. We need to take out those iniquities. That